Good evening. Tonight, every expense spared, guests include Paul Jones and the Blues Band, the author of the book More Frequently Stolen from Public Libraries Throughout the World Than Any Other, that's Norris McWhorter, and four gentlemen who will be discussing a controversial film inspired by the New Testament. Only yesterday, in The Scotsman, a prominent news item headed New Superstar Rao revealed that the film Jesus Christ Superstar has this week been banned from a cinema in the Western Isles as blasphemous a curse placed on another remote Scottish cinema which dared to screen Superstar in 1976 led to the recent closure of that particular house of entertainment. If Superstar still has this trouble nearly ten years after its creation, what hope does Monty Python's Life of Brian have today? Soon, the opinions of John Cleese, Michael Palin, Malcolm Muggeridge and Mervyn Stockwood, the Bishop of Southwark. Here's a moderately controversial clip from the film. Hello, Mother. Don't you hello, Mother me. What are all those people doing out there? Oh, well, well I... Uh... Come on, what have you been up to, my leg? I think they must have popped by or something. Popped by? Swarmed by, more like? <laughs> what are you doing out there? They, they started following me yesterday. Well, they can stop following you right now. <laughs> That extract featured Graham Chapman as Brian and Terry Jones, who also directed the picture, as Mandy, mother of Brian. <laughs> With us tonight, another one-third of Monty Python, John Cleese and Michael Palin. You see cutbacks. Oh, yeah. Michael, why the name Brian? Well, I don't know. We've always used Brian in Python to, to portray a certain sort of character, a fairly anonymous, and, and I apologise to anyone called Brian, slightly sort of... I mean, there's a good chance of... dim. <laughs> no, 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 dim. That's not fair, is it? Slow, slow to, to, to catch on. And there's a fighting chance of at least one Brian watching tonight, so be well, careful. Well, I don't know. Have you seen the figures? <laughs> <laughs> cheap, wasn't it cheap? No, actually, John did a. John was in a sketch about uh, the uh, footballer being interviewed in one of the very early Python shows, and it was all, uh, you know, Brian. Yeah, the ball in the back right. of the net, Brian. <laughs> I'm opening a boutique, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> but it's all, it's one of the funny names, isn't it? It's like Trevor and Kevin. I mean, they're just funny. <laughs> <laughs> what inspired the film Life of Brian? I mean. How did that strange idea take root in, and, and in, in, indeed in whose skull did it take root? Well, uh, we're not exactly certain. It's always difficult to, mm. to, to, to find the exact moment when it, when it came up. But I know that when we were, um, we were going around the world sort of doing premieres for, for the Holy Grail, and we had a lot of time to spare in airports and cafes and restaurants. We got to thinking about a new film and what particular area we might go in. And we were still keen to do a historical film, I said, you know, more fun dressing up and all that. We'd done the Bowler Hatted City Gents on, on Python. And I, th I think it was Eric who came up with this title out of the blue called Jesus Christ Lust for Glory. Um, <laughs> and I must admit that when we started talking about it, we actually explored the idea of doing a comedy film about Jesus, you know, with, with all the jokes about someone trying to book a table for 12 at the Last Supper. <laughs> Sorry, sir, uh, you know, Saturday night, I'll do you three fours. <laughs> Coming tomorrow, no, it's got to be tonight, and all those jokes. 
And, and the more, that, but the more that we read about Jesus and, and the background to, to his life, it was quite obvious that there was very little to ridicule in Jesus' life. Um, and therefore, we were sort of onto a loser. The characters we like to portray in Python are failures, are dim, are idiotic, are sort of incapable in one way or another. Jesus was a straight, direct man, so making very good sense. And so we, we decided that we'd be very, sort of just a rather shallow film just about Jesus. So we got Brian in. You must have known, though, that even in those early days, you were heading for trouble and uh, criticism and controversy. A, because you were well known. B, because, you know, to put it mildly, the uh, subject matter is quite well known. Yeah, I don't know. Did that worry you? I mean, I feel that Python, that that's, we've always thrived on that. It's always been a bit of an uphill struggle. When so what came first? first? I mean, I mean oh. was it the laughter idea or the message? I mean, which oh. was the first of the two that... It's the laughter. We go yeah. for the jokes first. I mean, the reason that it sounded like an interesting territory to go into, to explore, because when you go in there, you really don't know what you're going to write. I mean, we usually mm. sit around for about three days discussing theoretically what we're going to write, and then we go around and write something completely different. And the film actually starts when somebody comes in halfway through the second week and reads something out and we all laugh. And that's the first point yeah. on the graph. Yeah. Do you see what I mean? Yes, and then we yes. may wait, um, wait mm. another week and then somebody else writes something funny and then we have two points on the graph. And when we've got about yeah. six or seven, we start writing stuff to join it together. It's a pretty slow process because it's yeah. sort of democracy gone mad. It, so, it, it, took a long uh, just, it took a long time for, for, for Brian to Very really long. get off the ground. <clears throat> we wrote an awful lot which was then just thrown away because it was, it was sort of struggling too hard to be sort of controversial. Or, well, actually, or you know, Mike, that, I don't know. I agree with that because I don't think that we were coming in with stuff about Christ. Mm. We all started writing about around the edges, all the people yeah. who'd arrived five minutes after the miracle had been done. <laughs> <laughs> No, which is as bad as, as being 2,000 years late. The point yeah. is, if you didn't see it, you know it doesn't matter whether you're five minutes late or whatever. Actually, we did have the idea that he was the 13th uh, disciple, didn't we? A sort of slight yes, hanger right, yes. on. Yeah. Yes, that's right. <laughs> he, he was going to write a gospel, but he was always late. Because it, <laughs> it was also called <clears throat> Brian of Nazareth at one point, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. And yet you changed that title, yet that would have worked, wouldn't it, for this movie or not? Well, I think, I, I always thought that that title somehow asked for the comparison with, with um, Jesus of Nazareth, yeah. you know, the, the Powell thing, too much. It looked as though we were going for the comparison. But you apparently used uh, Lou Grade's sets that he used on Jesus of Nazareth. Didn't you, in fact, use the same the, yes. scenario? The ones he hadn't taken down. We, uh, <laughs> yes, we used, we used them for building our own sets in. There was temples there in Monastir, in this place in Tunisia. Which it was luck, like, really, yeah, because we, we, at one stage we were looking for about I think there were five or six different places we might have shot it. Italy, Spain, Jordan, Israel, Morocco, Tunisia. Yeah. And I think we decided Tunisia eventually, partly because we thought there might be religious trouble um, in, ca in uh, the Catholic mm. countries, and partly because we discovered they'd been making a lot of films uh, in the last two or three years yeah. in Tunisia. And then when you sort of say, we'll get the rushes here in the morning, you don't arrive and find there's a lot of rushes there. You know, there's practically actually... an industry over there of making mm. films about Jesus, because Rossellini had made a film then. Who? Lou Grade had been there for a couple of... Uh, Rossellini? Rossellini, an Italian director, oh. made a film about Jesus. Yeah. Then... Well, I don't worry. I miss that. <laughs> <laughs> he thought it was a footballer, didn't he? <laughs> I, no, I thought it was a food. FC Turin. No, Rossellini made this film and then I thought it was rather good. Is he good, Rossellini? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's a bit so he worked the second half, he was very good. Hit uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the ball and there it was in the, uh, in I mean, the back if, of the stand. If he's right. watching, I'm terribly yeah. sorry, but I've yeah. never heard of the guy. Well, he's films, made a film. Has it come he's out? He's made a film about Jesus. And it came out, yes, I think so. Well, Didn't the extraordinary thing is, Tim, I don't know all the facts of this because I was only told this about four days ago, but apparently there are now four quote, funny, unquote, films about the Bible coming out the next three months. As a result of Brian, well, or I just don't know. I think it's, it may just be coincidence. Mm. Mind you, we've been talking about it on and off for three years, so maybe the idea sort of filtered into somebody else's How did the whole thing get together? Because you, what, you had this great idea in an airport lounge or wherever, and still you have a fairly long way to go from you know, Terminal yeah. 2 to um, screens. It was a very big airport. Well, it is that pragmatic thing. Well, because you had trouble um, with the cash and, and yeah. backers pulling oh, out. Oh, yeah. terrible trouble, yes. In fact, if George Harrison hadn't known Eric Idle, uh, the film wouldn't have been made. Mm. Because although the Americans, I mean, after the EMI thing fell through, um, we then went to America. <laughs> <laughs> no, what happened, I didn't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> fell through. <laughs> fell through. Oh, fell through. Failed, failed to happen, yeah. as it were. Um, <laughs> we then went to, uh, to America, and uh, they were all prepared to give us a little bit of money, but not, enough that, uh, not as much mm. as we needed to make the film. So we needed, I think, $2.5 million to make it from, uh, for the American territories, and they wouldn't give us more than one three quarters. So come the middle of the year, um, we suddenly realised we weren't going to make it. And then out mm. of the blue, John Goldstone, the producer, said, well, I've got one more meeting with George Harrison. Mm. And George Harrison, which is, I think is, is really one of the great, almost magnificent acts of the century, mm. um, said he was quite happy to put up a million pounds for no other reason, mm. apparently, he wanted to see the movie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's true, yeah. Weren't you all in, in, in <clears throat> some danger of splitting up or... or, or at least some internal conflict. Did the film, in fact, bring you together? Yes, I mean, I think it, it, it did. After the Grail, there was about a year spent, sort of in the wilderness, as it were. No one quite sure what they wanted to do. And people going off to try and do their own things, faulty towers or ripping yarns or whatever. Um, also, there was a stage when we hated each other. <laughs> <laughs> well, I never hated you. <laughs> well, whatever any of the others may say, I always liked you. <laughs> what about your... your Solo projects. I mean, are there going to be any more ripping yarns, any more faulty towers? There'll be no more faulty towers. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. he, sent, he sent me a wonderful telegram last week when I had my 40th birthday, and it read, We love the first 40 stop. Are you going to do any more? <laughs> You got it right. <laughs> well, are you? I mean, is there going to be a... I don't think so, no. I, I, I feel we've, we, we've done that, just as I felt about Python and the Teddy, that you actually reach a point, and then you, it's the law of diminishing returns. You could go on. And does that mean there won't be any more Pythons on the Teddy? Highly unlikely at the moment. But not Highly totally unlikely. Well, not ruled totally. Out. I mean, I don't think anything is absolutely, uh, definitely ruled out. I'll tell you but what I hate, and that's the sausage machine. And you get into yes. it. The moment you sign on the, uh, on the dotted line, 13 shows, that's eight months in the diary, filming, editing, mm. rehearsing. It's much nicer to take one two-hour or hour and a half thing, like a film, yeah. and spend a lot of time. And then you can savour it and explore and do a lot of talking, which is much better than having to get everything written every day. See, John gets very oppressed by work. Mm. So he doesn't <laughs> like work. <laughs> and that, I mean, I, what I feel about the Python shows is that actually I don't know where we would start off. I think we, we, we almost, almost did everything in those, in those three series, and, and I just don't know... I mean, we'd we're practically again. doing it tonight because we were saying in the dressing room, yes. you know, I mean, it's terribly funny. It suddenly struck us that here we are, you know, and a, a Bishop and Malcolm Muggeridge are going to come on. You know, <laughs> it's, uh, in the studio tonight, yes. You know, it's not, it's not a bishop. sketch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it may be, John. Are you implying that possibly there might be a third or fourth, rather, fourth uh, Python movie, full length film? This is, this is certainly on the cards. Yes, though. in fact, we're supposed to be meeting, aren't we? Mon November the 19th? Monday week, Your place? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> to, to discuss this very thing. I think it's very likely that we'll do another film. But we, again, we want to see if there's, if there's a, an area that nobody's gone into, mm -hmm. really. You see, because the one thing about this film, I mean, I really like it, and there's a lot of mm. stuff we've done I don't like that much. But I, I, I really like this film. And I, there are moments when I watch it, and I think... I haven't seen anything like this before on the screen. <laughs> is, is there anything that you think could offend you on screen? I, mean, I, <laughs> I have one tiny quibble, and I think that, that Terry Vita. Jones and, and, and Graham Chat will no doubt disagree with me, but I think that the, the crucifixion thing at the end is not about pain. It's about death, and they are very separate. So what's your beef? My beef is that there are one or two close-ups of one or two people registering pain. And I think that that confuses what the last thing's about. Because, I mean, one's not really making fun of the fact that someone has been flayed to this flesh mm. hung down and then nailed up. The point of that last thing is it's about death. You know, it's about attitudes to death. And it's quite possible to be relatively cheery about death. Quite possible. Mm. Not so it's easy. Yes. Well... For the moment, gentlemen, thank you very much. But I think we ought to see another clip from the movie. <laughs> no, please <laughs> stay where you are. We're going to see a second clip from the film, and after that we'll be joined by two gentlemen who don't normally review movies, but who this evening went to see it on our behalf. <laughs> Is there another 
another way down? Is there another path down to the river? Please, please help me. I've got to get... <laughs> oh, my foot! Oh, my <laughs> Our guest reviewers are Michael Muggeridge and Mervyn Stockwood, the Bishop of Southwark. I'd like to ask you, Bishop, first, uh, what was your review of the film? Well, first of all, I was very glad to think that you simply can't get rid of Jesus in uh, Europe today. Uh, Ceausescu of Romania, who I think thought, like most communists, that they're going to get rid of religion very quickly, found that, it's, as he said, it's, it's going to uh, hang around with us for quite a long time. And certainly, when you think of what uh, the, one of the greatest attractions on the stage, both films and, uh, I mean, acting, ever since Jesus Christ Superstar, uh, that's what's drawn the crowds. I mean, Jesus is a most disturbing influence. You simply can't get away from him. You may worship him, respect him, uh, commit your life to him, or just ridicule him and lampoon him, but you simply can't get rid of him. And this is what I think is a very, very interesting factor. Even in China, in their changeover now, they tried to, they thought Cha Cha the Th Chairman Mao's thoughts had, re had replaced the thoughts of Jesus. But poor old Mao and the gang of four now really they're on, the, in the, on the dog heap and Jesus is being allowed back. So that, first of all, is uh, something which I find extremely interesting. Now, the, 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 the second thing I well, here's a question I would ask. Um, what are you really trying to say in this film? I believe you were on this a wee bit earlier, but unfortunately we only got the picture outside, not the voice, which was uh, something that <laughs> husbands might want for their wives. But, uh, <laughs> the, but so we didn't quite hear your defence of it. But what I want to, what are you really trying to say? Now, I wasn't the least bit horrified. And people say, oh, well, no, Bishop, when you go there, you'll be absolutely horrified. I wasn't at all. After all, I wasn't vicar of the university church for nothing. I am, I mean, I'm familiar with undergraduate humour. <laughs> And I was also a governor of a, of a mentally deficient school. <laughs> and once I was a prep school master, I felt frightfully at home. I thought I was just sort of back on old familiar ground this evening. But I really wondered, I mean, what you were trying to say. I, I do hope you don't think I'm, I'm being unkind, because I know some of you, and I am very fond of you and have respect for you. But I say this quite frankly. I, I simply don't think it was worthy of you. It was the sort of thing, as I say, that at Cambridge the footlights did on a damp Tuesday afternoon, uh, or the lower fourth when I was a schoolmaster. Uh, did you uh, but I just don't know what you were saying. Then the third thing, unless I get rather more serious, uh, I mean, why lampoon death? I think this is the thing that really is, uh, you know, 
that sort of worried me. Uh, I don't think one would make a farce about Auschwitz uh, or of death. And I mean, whatever we think about Jesus, who we may think he was the son of God, we may think he was a mistaken fanatic, but it was a pretty shattering thing what, what happened, the, the, the crucifixion. And you know, as I, uh, I, as I looked at that and I thought of now, uh, the way people react to the cross, and after all, I'm not ashamed to wear the cross here, which is the sign of a bishop. Uh, when I look at that figure, I mean, I know you're going to say Brown isn't Jesus, but I mean, that's just rubbish. The, uh, it was the, uh, the whole thing is quite clearly, if, that, if, if no Jesus had lived, that film wouldn't have been produced. But did you feel that the film actually ridiculed Jesus? Yes. I did. Even though it wasn't about him and... Well, I'm afraid, you see, I can't think it wasn't about him. I mean, I put that to as a matter of honesty. If Jesus of Nazareth had never existed, there'd never been a Jesus, then this film of Brown, of Brown would never have been produced. I'm sure that's his... Uh, Could I... But if I, might just, <laughs> if, if I might just say, and uh, then do come and cross-examine me then, but my mind is just sort of working on that last scene, sort of the reaction. I mean, there it seemed sort of a tremendous sort of joke, and people were laughing. And then you think of the reaction of a person like Mother Teresa to that scene, what it meant for her. Now, she's a saint, I'm not. But every day of the week, I have the same Mass, or I'm President of Mass, I was this morning in the early hours, and I broke the bread, this is my body, and I took the cup, this is my blood. And I didn't roar around with laughter at the altar in my chapel this morning. I just fell down, genuflected, and worshipped, said, my Lord and my God. Now, um, I don't think really that uh, you come and get at me now. Well, I... I'm not criticizing any of you personally. Well, I hasten to say that I had absolutely nothing to do with the film whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> but um, before I ask John and Michael to perhaps answer one or two of those points, could I bring in Malcolm and ask you what your review, if... Reviews Certainly, right yes. Um, <clears throat> remember that I was engaged for four years in the appalling task of trying to make English people laugh as editor of Punch. It's an almost impossible thing to do. But I couldn't help <laughs> feeling enormous envy of the ease with which this particular film aroused laughter. You simply had to use a four-letter word or display a man's private parts in the window, and the whole place <laughs> fell on the ground with laughter. <laughs> so that I, you know, professionally uh, felt uh, rather put out by that. Also, of course, I agree entirely with the bishop that it is quite humbug to say that this is not a, a, um, a ridiculing of the founder of the Christian religion and of the incarnation in an extremely cheap and tense-rate way. Remember that that story of the incarnation was what our whole civilization began with. Remember that it has inspired every great artist, every great writer, every great composer, every great builder, every great architect, that to celebrate that marvelous thing. Germany, the, the Inquisition and so forth, it's sort of... Yes, the Inquisition <laughs> But uh, nothing can alter the fact that if you were to make a list of all the greatest works of art in all fields and all the greatest contributors to those works of art, you would find that this scene of the incarnation, the story of the incarnation, has played the largest part. Now, in our 20th century, the, this film produces a sort of graffiti version of it. And I don't think, in the eyes of posterity, it will have a very distinguished place. The bishop mentioned Mother Teresa, and I was thinking of her too, because to her, you see, and it's something that the makers of this program maybe didn't even think of, but the person of Jesus Christ, not as a historical figure, not as someone in the past, but someone living in the world now has been the essence of her existence. I once asked her what was the difference between what she did and what social workers do. And she said, well, 
The point is that social workers are very estimable people, but they do something, they serve their fellows for an idea. I serve my fellows for a person. And if that person wasn't there, or if that person was in some way discredited, then my work is over. And there are many people in the world, despite the fact that the media would suggest the contrary, to whom still this living presence of Jesus Christ in the world is the most essential part of their existence. And you produce it in a film as a derisory and absurd figure. And of course, to someone who has that feeling, as Mother Teresa has, or someone like Catherine Bramwell Booth has, it, they are deeply hurt and insulted. Uh, that doesn't in itself matter. I'd like to put another point to two that occurred to me when is I was it watching possible, it. Which Malcolm, is, I'm mm? also sorry to interrupt, but is it possible for John perhaps to answer one or two of those Certainly, points? certainly. Otherwise we're going to have certainly. nine points unanswered. But yes, it's building mm. up the list a bit. But I mean, the, the, the problem that we... No, seriously, the problem yes. that, we, that we have got is, is that you think that we're ridiculing Jesus. Mm. And we say, um, sort of sincerely and truthfully, mm. that that is certainly not what we intended to do, and I believe that we're not. And I can best answer that, I think, by answering um, Malvi's question, which is that, um, what were we trying to do? And I think it, it comes out, it was spelled out perhaps rather too plainly, rather too banally at one point, when he says, make up your own mind, don't let other people tell you. Hmm. And we would absolutely deny, at least I would, that yeah. there was any attempt to say you should not believe in Christ. What hmm. we're saying is take a critical view find out about it, don't just believe because somebody tells you to, somebody in the pulpit says something, question it, work it out yourself. You're seriously suggesting that if someone saw that film, say a young mm -hmm. kid who knew nothing about mm -hmm. the Gospels or about history, mm -hmm. that the figure of Christ that would emerge from it, this story of the Incarnation, would be a noble one, um, would be... He would have to yes. sort it out for himself. And, you and he, would, he would have to, for example, work out, I mean, does one accept every word in the Bible? In a mm. Sermon on the Mount, did they get it all right when Mark mm. wrote it down 30 years later? <laughs> I mean, was, was every word right? But is the film likely to be seen by anybody who doesn't know an awful lot about Jesus Christ? Uh, uh, most certainly it is most today. Uh, if you have it for children of 14 today, <laughs> you will find that the many, many children of 14 today, thanks to the secular nature of the education they're receiving, know nothing about it at all. And they would see this figure I think, in the light right. in which he appears yeah. in this film, you see. It's no good you cheating yourselves. Yeah. You can't have it both ways. You produce this particular... Uh, film which arouses bursts of laughter, as I said earlier, rather easily procured. But uh, don't imagine that someone seeing that is going to go away with the concept of the founder of the Christian religion and all that that meant to mankind uh, in any way corresponding to what history or the Gospels or anything else is presented. Well, Michael. it's not supposed to be about him, so people shouldn't go yes, but and see it's no good saying that it's not about him. I'm not being well. dishonest. I mean, I, I believe... being utterly dishonest, my dear chap. Yeah, I mean, I don't know whether, where this will get us, but the, I, I feel my approach to the film was I, I was mm. confused. I, I feel I'm still asking mm. questions, seeking solutions. I am very confused and perturbed by a religion an established religion in this country where people can go into church on a Sunday morning and the same people can sing hymns and say prayers and at the same time these people can stand by while their money is spent making bombs, making guns, building up appalling weapons of destruction, can sit by, sing hymns, say their prayers and agree with a policy in which uh, hospitals have to go without money. First of all, I'd very much like to know where you'll get your evidence. You must give me chapter and verse. So it happens that immediately before coming here, I was asked by crowds of church people mm -hmm. if I would stand up for the, uh, for the councils of the, the, the health of, the, of, the, of St. Olive's Hospital, which the government is trying to close. The church is extremely active in, in, these, uh, in, in these fields. And I would urge you not to make these careless generalizations, no, I, which I, are not dependent on evidence. Now, I what, make them in all humility. I'm uh, seeking answers and solutions. I'm not saying this is absolutely uh, the way it is, but I have observed well, people... Well, I'm saying it's absolutely... No. Well, I mean, what you're saying, I mean, it's, it's a great thing, it's sheer rubbish. 
Uh, well, as you made a ridiculous gender generalization which is unworthy of an educated man. Now, having well, said you. this, back to what you say, somebody aged 14 coming and seeing this thing of Jesus, what you are seeing is not one of the greatest teachers in the world. I mean, granted, lots of people, the majority of people wouldn't accept him as the son of God as I do, but surely most of us would see him as one of the greatest teachers of the world. Now, you wouldn't guy Socrates or make him appear as a clown. And what I think Maybe this Maybe there are funny things about him. What? Maybe there are funny things about Socrates. Why shouldn't we make jokes about well, Socrates? Well, if there are certain aspects of the world, you would not Socrates. No, it's not my so point. Socrates I don't know enough about Socrates. Also Socrates also was murdered. He was, he was made, to, uh, made to drink poison. You wouldn't guy him at that point or make him appear as a clown. And what I say, and I'm afraid you won't offer my conviction, John, over this, is that this most what is to a Christian the most sacred moment of the whole Jesus experience, namely his death, that at that most sacred moment he was guyed and made to look as a clown. What May I make general? another point just here, which is rather interesting, that if you'd made that film, about, if you'd made that film about Mohammed, you see, there would have been an absolute hullabaloo in this country. Uh, mm -hmm. Because the, and the, all the sort of, um, you know, the racial, anti-racialist people would have risen up in their might. The same people who would approve of this and would have said this is quite disgraceful. And behind people's minds would be the thought of maybe they might lose a bit of oil, you know by doing it. But, the, but you see the but difference. You're right, Malcolm. I mean, 400 years ago, we would have been burnt for this film. Now, I'm suggesting that we've made an advance. Mm. And I'm suggesting... <laughs> I'm, I'm suggesting that compared with other presentations of this great event, the incarnation, uh, you have not made an advance. And that anybody in the future who might dredge up this miserable little film, and it's quite possible they might, as a piece of social history, uh, they would certainly not uh, wish to relate it to the, the thing, say, Chart Cathedral, which is, which is built to the, glory of, to the glory of Christ. Not a funny building, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but they might want to compare not, it with 40 towers. Yes, they're not even an, intended to be a funny building. Well, we, it has the gargoyles on it, you know. Michael, Michael. I think that, uh, and I've seen this in the sort of reviews of the film, they concentrate always on the religious angle. Uh, even, you know, before they've seen it, they've decided this is a film about religion. I don't think it is entirely. I think that what we've chosen to do is what we've always done in Python. We've done for three series and done for three films. We have taken a certain group of people, which are generally sort of England in the present day, and put them into a historical context. I think that's what we've done with this film. I think it isn't entirely about religion. It's about the people who live in anyone who lives and makes up uh, our society today. It's also about closed systems of thought, whether they're political or theological or religious, whatever. Systems by which whatever evidence is given to the person, he merely adapts it, mm. fits it into his ideology. You show the same event to a Marxist and a Catholic, for example, they both of them fine, they both have explanations of it. I mean, it's what to be pompous poppers on about with falsifiability of theories. I mean, once you've got, actually got, um, an idea that is whirring round so fast that no other light or contrary evidence can come in, then I think it's very dangerous. I don't think it's dangerous to someone like Malcolm, because he's actually a very nice man. But I think he is the sort of guy that this film is actually having a go at, because I don't think that there's any evidence that can come to him now that is going to make him rethink, think, am I right? Am I making a mistake? Well, um, you can leave that out. Um, I think I could say with utter sincerity that there was nothing in this particular film that would lead me to uh, want to change conclusions that I've reached after living for seven to six years in this world. Is there anything? Uh, That's the point I make. Well, in this film, there was nothing that could possibly, because the, the film itself bore so little... No, but the point relation. I was making, Mark, yes. was not the film. Forget the mm. film. We'll say yes. that's rubbish. OK. Is there anything that can happen to you now oh, that could cause you to but change your mind? Of course, every single person uh, who is alive and spiritually alive uh, is constantly reviewing his faith. I do not believe for a moment 
that there is a definitive faith and you say, there it is. But there's nothing in this little squalid number that could possibly uh, affect any, anybody. Now, in that sense, I give you Might this point. Not, I give I you this point that there's nothing in this film that could possibly destroy anybody's genuine faith. Nope, no, that I no, grant you no, absolutely, absolutely not, no. uh, because it's much too tenth rate for that. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, um, but what I still contend is that someone who is young, 14 years old, seeing that without any particular background might really imagine that that buffoonery is an expression yes. of this great episode. Well, which... you see, I, I was also, you talked about the presentation of Christianity. I mean, I went to an English preparatory school and an English public school, Clifton College, with a sports academy. I West sympathize South. with yes. you. <laughs> I, was, I was given eight or ten years, ten years, of a form of Christianity which I grew to despise and dislike. Mm -hmm. Largely, it so insulted my intelligence. The sermons that were given at the age of 11 and 12, I felt insulted my intelligence. When I got into writing this film, and we all had exactly the same reaction, we started to discover mm. a lot of stuff about Christianity, and I started to get angry. Because I started to think, why was I given this rubbish, this tenth-rate series of platitudes, <laughs> when there were interesting things to have discussed? Mm. There were factual and things. You nobody ever told me, you nobody ever told me that they don't know what language the mm. Gospels were written mm. in, and that they don't even know who wrote them, mm. and they're not even sure what cities they were well, written in. Well, then you in. must have read very superficially at your school. Uh, That's your, look, John, it's very bad luck for you, but you see, I used to go to Clifton College to preach very often when you were there. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know, I know the headmaster, I know the staff, I know the servant. Mm. All I can say is you must have been as idle a boy, as, <laughs> uh, as splendid an actor as you are. Uh, I because wasn't actually, if I you, was if you really to take this seriously, I mean, you had some no, absolute those, first those class teachers. They were a joke. Mm. They were a joke. Well, and of course you made them. You no. cannot. You. It, I was how open. do you know about? I, I know open. people who have lived in college of exactly your own period. I remember who are now the priests sermons. in my I, diocese. I remember the sermons. I remember. You don't remember mine. Tell me what I preached on. <laughs> no idea. <laughs> I only remember the bad ones. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I remember a gentleman coming and telling us how very difficult it had proved to get the Bible into Tibet, you know? They'd had well, seven it's... occasions. The first time there'd been landslides, the yeah. second time there'd been rains yeah. and pages had got stuck together. The third time, <laughs> no, this is true. the third time the mules had fallen off the mountainside, the fourth time there were thunderbolts, and the seventh time he said, God helped us, and we got, got the Bibles into Tibet. And the obvious conclusion was that he was trying like hell to stop them getting the Bible. <laughs> We really are lampooning this because by O levels and A levels, going on the whole time, people were taking, uh, taking the scripts they'd had to have studied Greek, perhaps Hebrew, and have had made a serious study of the scriptures. You chose not to do that. I'm sure we you made had far more interesting study. things to do. We only had four years to write the film. We didn't want to get too specialist because if we got no, too I'm specialist. I'm sorry, I'm talking about Clifton College. But oh, still, sure. I don't really think this has got very much to do Could I just ask, as um, I think in theory anyway, a sort of Moderator, I'm supposed to be neutral. Of the Church of Scotland or the no. Church of England. <laughs> I'm supposed to be in the middle, but um, didn't you? I mean, I felt when I saw the film, and I saw it in a cinema in New York with a very um, appreciative audience, did you not feel that in fact the people being lampooned were the followers rather than Jesus himself? No, I, mean, no, I felt no, that very strongly. No, no, I, I don't think so. It was. I really felt, I mean, the, the crucifixions above all else, which are things that I, that I felt sad about because, I mean, I'm quite sure, as all of us will one day, and this is not trying to attack your vulnerabilities, but life is very short, all of us will be on our deathbeds in a comparatively short <coughs> time, and when, I, when we are, and that will be no laughing matter, the, uh, that it is much that Christ which I should like to be held up in front of me, 
than the Christ I yeah. saw but the on film did, did, did bring I home just, to me. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. I was going to say very quickly that the, 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 the film reminded me of something which I obviously knew, but one tends to forget that it wasn't only Jesus that was crucified. I mean, an awful lot of people were crucified in the most horrific circumstances yes. every day of the week under yes, Roman rule. Yes, and, that's very true. And that, that fact came home in the film. You realize that, that Jesus didn't have a sort of total uh, copyright to crucifixion. No, but Jesus was crucified, wasn't he, for his obedience to the, to the will of God. You but can't he was say, he was you can't crucified, surely, for, for blasphemy. The reason, yes, but they accused him of blasphemy because he was obedient to the will of God and of his kingdom. You can't say that that came over to, uh, today that with any of the people who were being crucified, no, but that wasn't they were, I mean, the whole way that it was done, it, that they were not dying for a noble idea. Well, uh, neither were the... Yeah, but, I mean, I, I think that what... Can I just make the point I was trying to make earlier on about uh, the film not being seen entirely in religious terms? That, uh, I mean, as Tim has said, people were crucified then as common criminals. It was just a form mm. of, of capital punishment employed by the Romans who were regarded as a highly civilised people. But it was capital punishment. And in the film, we examine attitudes to capital punishment. As far as I know, in this country, the majority of people we are constantly told are in favour of capital punishment. It just seems that we haven't come that far in all that time. Why do you think that through all these centuries of Christendom, that the greatest minds, the most creative minds, the greatest artists were believers in this thing that you airily dismiss and say that you, making this little film, have uh, managed to see deeply into it I, I and to reach know. conclusions. I can't say they are. What, 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 what about what about Bertrand Russell? You dismiss them, of course. No, they I, don't care. I, no, I said that I said in, this, <laughs> I said in the centuries of Christendom, I didn't say in our time, mm. I said that if you were to make a list of all the mm. people who have contributed most Most to of them would have been Muslims literature. if they'd been no, living in the Arab countries they, they, or Buddhists <clears> if they'd been living what in... what has the... that got to do with it? These people because... were inspired. <laughs> these people were inspired by this event which you have celebrated in this film by a lot of people on crosses singing a, a sort of... Um, as though it's sort of rather uh, inferior death, musical. Death uh, perhaps doesn't matter that much, which no, after all you're saying the whole time. I'm, I, you, you're looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to it keenly, yes. but I'm so looking so forward to it. About it? Yeah, no, I'm looking forward to it keenly because I know, because I relate it to these very things that you dismiss. I relate it to the story of the Incarnation, this great drama of the Incarnation, which you have reduced to a sort of uh, comic film. Now, you think that in doing that, you have shed light. But I have to tell you that you haven't shed light. You've made some rather bad jokes, and the only reason that people come to see it is because they still relate it to this extraordinary story of the Incarnation, which is, in fact, the beginning and the end of everything that our civilization stands for. It, our civilization began with a man, the Apostle Paul, telling pagan world about the incarnation. That was the yes, beginning of it. We're not the only civilization in the world. Not at all. No, I'm not There's saying a lot we are. of civilizations Certainly. with different religions. Certainly. Right? I'm not. And, and the important thing is that people should be open to the various but possibilities said, and that they should take critical but, attitudes. Yes, but whoever said they shouldn't be open, but you don't make people open by producing the sort of buffoonery that well, you, you produce there. you certainly don't make people open by giving them the kind of garbage I was given at the school. Well, then, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, very, um, I'm very sympathetic to you for having received this garbage, some of it at the hands of our friend the Bishop here. I'm very sympathetic indeed, and I think it's very sad and tragic that you should have been cut off from something that's so wonderful and only given garbage. But I would simply point out to you but if you look, if you, if you care about what constitutes what we call Western civilization, which now probably is coming to an end, and you were to consider the role that's been played in that by this thing that you treat as a piece of buffoonery, uh, you, would, you would have a certain humility in saying that you have been able, through making it, to, uh, to shed light. But you keep something. making well, the basic assumption. Sorry, let me just say this, yeah. Mike. You keep making the basic assumption that we are ridiculing Christ and Christ's teaching, and I say that we are not. But do you imagine that your scene, for instance, of the Sermon on the Mount, 
the scene in this in your your film of the Sermon on the Mount right. is not ridiculing one of the most sublime utterances that any human being has ever spoken on this earth. Of course it is. No, no, it's Absolutely making fun not. of the guy who's remembered it wrong and of the people who don't understand it and miss mm. the point. Well, I think, I that think that's it's really unfair because I think that a lot of people looking in will think that we have, we have actually ridiculed Christ yes. physically. Mm. Christ is played by an actor, Ken Colley. He speaks the words... Um, from the Sermon on the Mount. He's treated absolutely respectfully. The camera then pans away. We go to right to the back of the crowd to someone who shouts, speak up, mm. because they cannot hear him. <laughs> now, I mean, if that utterly, no, no, that that utterly no, undermines that faith isn't... in Christ, no, no, then I think faith cannot be turned that strong. Saying, I started off by saying that this is such a 10th rate film that I don't believe that it would disturb yes, I know you anybody's faith. with an faith. open mind. I realise that. I, I, I <laughs> said that. <laughs> John. John, can I put you a, que a, a question? Now, without I hope in any way sort of being pompous, I mean, I have been Bishop in, of South London now for over 20 years, and I'm appalled by the sadness, the unhappiness, the tragedy of life, and the drug scene, the, the, the violence, the muggings, and so on. And um, many people now are standing back with a measure of deep disturbance and horror. I was at the University at Cambridge only the Sunday before last, and I'm told how the undergraduates are now are turning up in chapel and seeking, seeing if Christianity has got something to offer. There, I think, I mean, most of us, I'm sure we'd be all, however much we may differ on, on, on this film, that we are deeply disturbed by what's going on in the world and in this country. Now, we are, there is a desire to find truth to find some answer to our problems. And the question, I mean, I would put to you, I mean, could you really put your hand on your heart and say that that film is going to help the younger generation absolutely. and its pilgrimage for truth? If they think well, about John, it, absolutely. The, the, the message is, what is it, Mike? What are the words? Uh, work it out for yourself. You're all individuals. Don't do what people tell you to do. And that's not the... the uh, you that's find the, that a final, a sort of final... No, no, a, starting point. Starting point. Starting point. Starting point. Including and, the lampooning of Christ. And what? the lampooning of his death, which is the most, the most no, disgraceful just, well, part of the whole thing. Well, I think that's just thing. Surely, Mark, it was the lampooning can't... of a form of death, which, which happened to You're hundreds of people. You're lampooning a scene which has been played an fantastic part in the lives of believers for generations, a scene that has inspired the most amazing, uh, amazing yeah. disinterestedness, creativity, that set St. Francis of Assisi wandering yes. about the streets, uh, uh, that, that inspired St. Augustine <laughs> to write The City of God. That, this that I accept, but I all think that is true, and all you've done is well, to make a lot of people on a cross singing a music, a, a, a music hall song. Well, and, and a lot I of mean, people, it's so disgusting when you think that, of it. A lot of see? people go away very happy, laughing at that, their faith not touched one jot. I don't think I really do. I, I don't think it will. And we'll come back at this point. Yes. And a lot of people on the first Good Friday went away from Calvary laughing their heads off and thinking the death of Jesus was a tremendous joke. But that's very true, you know. Because, as a matter of fact, all you've done is to, for the person you followed in this film, is Herod. Because it was Herod who organised this absurd scene. And I'm only amazed that you didn't get some comic effects out of the out of the crown of thorns. That's if the only thing to, that puzzles Martha, me in the film. If you wanted to make a joke out of Jesus, Jesus would have appeared on the cross. He was an actor. He was there in the film. Mm. He does not appear on no, the cross. But you, no, you one at all. It's a gang of thieves, of common criminals, yes. who were at that time crucified in hundreds day by day. I mean, that's... I'm, I'm sorry, I know Could, that you think I'm wrong, but that's what I feel. Well, I it is not Christ. I think it's a ludicrous thing, can I just because say I that tell the, you that the, the people Christ see him. This, this is what the film's about. You Markham, can I just say that, 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 <laughs> that to an outsider, the crucifixion um, is, is a much stronger event if one realises that Christ went through something that everybody went through. But if you if you treat it like something that only he went through, which well, is the image you get, well, I never realised well, I was about 16 was, uh, that I mean, if, everybody if, got crucified. If, 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 if he was crucified between... I also have to say that we have to... I mean, he was crucified between two thieves. If you're saying that the experience yes, were, of those three people was the same experience simply because they went through the same physical experience, then you are utterly misunderstanding what 
the crucifixion means, what the passion means, why it's had this enormous role in people's lives. It, it wouldn't have had that role if it was simply one of innumerable men dying on a cross. It's because of what it signified that, the, that, 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 that in, in terms of the incarnation, and of course you leave that all out of account. What you've done is you've made, you, you've succeeded in doing, and that for that reason it will have absolutely no influence in the long run, you have succeeded in reducing something which has inspired the greatest art into something which is presented in terms of the lowest art. If you That's your feet. That's if you your set up your own terms that we have to influence people. We're not saying we want to influence no, people. I don't. We're trying to make them laugh, make yes. them happy. I mean, yes. it's, it's, that's something that helps. Gentlemen, I'm going to have to call a horse. I'm very sorry. I think you've made people happy and made them think and made them laugh. And, uh, well, I, I think we'll I, make them talk about it. I can't well, you'll, get your 30 pieces, <laughs> you'll get your 30 pieces of silver. Well, I, 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 I'm quite sure. <laughs> I hasten to add that... You're missing the most wonderful thing in life and you're seeing it in those terms and it's utterly tragic Gentlemen, thank you very much. Utterly um, tragic. I hope that that film My won't shake aches. anybody's faith.